All right, uh, so today behind me, I've got two different things I want to show you. So the first one is Hire's Root Beer. Hire's Root Beer was a flavor of root beer that was very popular in the late 1800s and then into the you know early like 1910s and 1920s. So potentially this is the bottle that uh, Mr. Martin was carrying and that he handed to Violet. And then over here on the other side of me is a picture of a Palmer agent. Now, if you remember right before, I just so abruptly cut you off yesterday with Mr. Martin jumping out of the train, um, the two men looking for Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin identified as Palmer agents. And Palmer agents, this was kind this was in a time before the FBI. And so Palmer agents were kind of this precursor to the FBI. Um, that the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, kind of used to help, um, you know, with with uh, kind of as like a national police force kind of idea. Uh, there was a lot of critique against the Palmer agents, though, because sometimes they were, you know, kind of used as uh, J. Edgar Hoover's kind of personal police force and kind of doing things that were personally beneficial to him and not necessarily for the whole country. But anyway, a lot of that's outside of our conversation. What you need to know is that that's a picture of a Palmer agent and that Palmer agents were kind of used to investigate people they thought were suspicious or dangerous to uh, potentially the security of the nation. So that gets us thinking about why Palmer agents would be looking for Mr. Martin. In fact, you had better. Give my apologies to the ladies. He opened one of the side doors of the vestibule and stepped out. Mr. Martin, Violet gasped. The side doors were for getting off the train, but getting off after it had stopped, of course. Violet didn't hear him hit the ground because the train was making so much noise. It was true it wasn't moving very fast, but she couldn't see what he'd stepped off into, and neither, she thought, could he. There might have been a 300-foot cliff beside the tracks, for all either of them knew. She dropped the root beer bottles, one of them shattered, and grabbed the handrail beside the still swinging door. She leaned out as far as she dared. She felt a warm wind on her face and smelled pine trees and coal smoke. Mr. Martin, she called. The train crested the mountain and started downward again, picking up speed. Violet heard a door behind her open. A heavy hand landed on her shoulder and hauled her back into the vestibule. The two men, Palmer agents, whatever those were, glared down at Violet. Violet. The one that who had grabbed her barked, What do you think you're doing, miss? Where's our pad fee? snapped the second one. Violet angrily jerked her shoulder free of the man's arm. Who? Or the man's hand. Who? Our pad fee. Where'd he go? Did he jump? I don't know what you're talking about, said Violet. Listen, miss. We're looking for Sandar, Sandor, our pad fee. Scar on his right face. I, one eye. Missing three fingers on his right hand. Sound like anybody you know? Three fingers, said Violet, playing dumb. She watched the remaining root beer bottle rolling around on the floor. We're not going to get anywhere with this one, said the second agent. She warned him, said the first agent, pointing to Violet. He gripped Violet's arm hard. It hurt. Where's our pad fee, girl? Don't play games with us. This is a criminal investigation of the highest order. Treason, the other agent said succinctly. Violet felt a twist in her stomach. Treason? She'd always heard was worse than murder. But why should she believe those two idiots? She couldn't make her own. She could make her own decisions about people. Mister Martin didn't seem like a traitor to her. She glared at the agents and said nothing. He must have jumped. The agent who had hold of Violet's arm, nodding at the swinging at the side door, which was still swinging, opening a few inches and then gently slamming itself shut again. I'm going after him. The agent let go of Violet and kicked the door wide open. Violet could see the light shining out the train's many windows, flickering over the ground, moving by below. The agent turned to the other agent. Question the suffs. See if you can get any of them to understand what accessory after the fact means. Then, get off in Roanoke and cable J. Edgar Hoover that we've spotted our pad fee. He stepped out through the door. No! Violet cried, horrified as he jumped. The train was by no means moving as slowly as it had been when Mr. Martin jumped off. Come on, miss, said the other agent, grabbing her arm. Let's see what you and the suffs can manage to babble out. You know, I don't believe he ever told us his name, Miss Dexter said loudly. Violet was surprised at how well she pretended to be stupid. And surprised, she was willing to do it for Mr. Martin, whom Miss Dexter clearly disliked. He joined us at Union Station and begged a spare seat in our car, but he's a complete stranger to me. 
The agent, who had finally admitted that his name was Mr. Christopher, had sat down in Mr. Martin's empty seat and unfolded a paper on his lap, a rough pencil sketch that could have been Mr. Martin in the same vague way that pictures of Uncle Sam could have been Violet's grandfather Mayhew. Violet's grandfather Mayhew. It did have a scar on it. Many of the other suffragists had gotten up and crowded around, clinging to the backs of their seats for balance. Miss Dexter, Mr. Christopher said, try to get this through that female wool you call a brain, the suffragists hissed. This man is dangerous. He poses a threat to the United States of America. By helping to conceal him, you could be guilty of treason. What's he supposed to have done, demanded a gray-haired suffragist in a purple dress. I can't tell you that, said Mr. Christopher. The woman in purple snorted. Mr. Christopher asked a number of questions about whether anyone had heard Sandor Arpadfi mention where he had been, or where he was going, or any names of friends or relatives or associates. Nobody offered him much help. Did he say anything that sounded Bolshevist? Mr. Christopher finally demanded. You know, anything un-American. Miss Dexter shrugged delicately. I suppose some of the things he said were a bit socialist, she said. But there's an enormous difference between a Bolshevist and a socialist. That's what the socialists would like you to think, said Mr. Christopher. Socialists are good Americans, said the woman in purple angrily. They believe in cooperation instead of competition. Many of the greatest and wisest people in our country are socialists. Mr. Christopher sneered. That's why women shouldn't be allowed to vote, he said. The female mind isn't capable of making fine distinctions of logic. The woman turned as purple as her dress. Miss Helen Keller is a socialist, she stormed, and Lillian Wald is a socialist. Miss Jane Addams is a socialist. Miss, if they kept their addled brains out of politics, maybe someone would marry them, Mr. Christopher said nastily. He got to his feet. The train was slowing as if approaching a station. The crowd was closing in on him. Mr. Christopher took his pencil sketch and notebook and retreated. What a horrid man, said Miss Dexter. The other suffragists agreed heartily. They made their way back to their seats, and Violet could hear them talking speculating she supposed about mr martin and what he'd done to get those dreadful government agents chasing him violet's stomach squirmed she hoped oh whoops i skipped a whole page she hoped the ground hadn't been too far away when mr martin had hit it where he had landed where had he landed and what would he do now violet looked over at the woman in purple there was an empty seat next to her violet got up and jostled over and sat down in uh, down in it excuse me miss Kelly, said the woman, sticking out her hand and smiling. Fortunately, Miss Kelly didn't seem to know that children should speak only when spoken to. Florence Kelly, pleased to meet you. Violet shook hands and introduced herself. What are Palmer agents, Miss Kelly? Miss Kelly frowned. Is that who those clowns were? I thought that might I thought that might be it. Mr. Palmer is the U.S. Attorney General, and he's got a crazy assistant called J named J. Edgar Hoover. Miss Kelly rolled her eyes at the ridiculous name. Their agents track down radicals and arrest them. Arrest them for what, said Violet. Mostly for being against the war, said Miss Kelly. But the war is over, said Violet. Parts of it are, Miss Kelly said. And what are Bolshevists, Violet asked. She had some idea, but she wanted to hear what Miss Kelly would say, especially since Miss Kelly was one of those rare adults, like Chloe and Mr. Martin, who talked about things that mattered and let you ask questions. The Bolshevists are the people who overthrew the Tsar in Russia, said Miss Kelly. But people just use the word to mean anybody that wants to change the way things are, to make us sound dangerous. Some people say we suffragists are Bolsheviks. Violet nodded. She had heard that. How is your little friend in the Jim Crow car, Miss Kelly asked. Violet looked at her, surprised. She's all right, she said. The seats aren't so nice there, but she's fine. Violet didn't think it was fine at all, actually. But Miss Dexter had seemed to, and she was an adult. It's a national shame, said Miss Kelly. This Jim Crow business, my organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is fighting to put an end to it. There's no reason decent people can't ra ride in a train car with each other. Violet stared at Miss Kelly, but you're not colored, she said. Then she covered her mouth, shocked at her own rudeness. No, I'm not. But that doesn't mean I can't fight for justice side by side with colored people, said Miss Kelly, patting. Miss Kelly patted Violet on the shoulder. You know it's wrong putting your friend in another train car. When you know right from wrong, don't let anyone tell you differently. They both looked over at Miss Dexter. I won't, Miss Kelly, said Violet, and meant it. Soon it was time to fold down and rearrange the seats into berths. A porter came in to help them with this. Violet climbed into a top berth beside Miss Dexter. She lay awake for a long time, 
Boxed in by the train's curving metal ceiling, the wall, the thin, lumpy mattress, and Miss Dexter. She thought about Myrtle in the Jim Crow car, probably sitting up all night in that rat and seat. Finally, Violet drifted off to sleep and dreamt that she was running and running, trying to catch a train that had left a long time ago. Sometimes, the train stopped at stations and Violet woke, sliding forward as her head bumped against the partition. Then she fell back asleep until the train started again and her feet hit the partition at the other end. The train whistle let out a long, loud moan each time the train came to a crossing. Finally, Violet gave up sleeping and lay awake wondering what Mr. Martin had done to get people called Palmer agents after him and whether he had survived his leap into the dark. Chapter 10, Yellow and Red Roses. Thanks for watching.